Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Campus Consortium's Ed Talk Site Seminar featuring Harvard University. In today's presentation, we will focus on the future of IT and education. Our presenters include Peter Boll, Vice Provost for Advances in Learning at Harvard University, and Mr. Roger Mills, Senior Consultant at Campus Consortium. We will take questions at the end of today's presentations that have been typed into the chat box or questions pane in the GoToWebinar control panel. Without further ado, please allow me to present Mr. Mills and Mr. Bull. Over to you, Mr. Mills. And a very good afternoon and welcome to Ed Talks, hosted by Campus Consortium. As some of you know, Ed Talks is to facilitate thought leadership in the education community. Today's session is part of our 2020 series. We have asked our guest speaker to share with us his thoughts on what will education look like in 2020 and how will information technology evolve to meet the needs of students, faculty, and administration. I would like to extend a warm welcome to today's guest speaker, Mr. Peter Bowl, Vice Provost for Advances in Learning at Harvard University. We are very honored that Mr. Bull has given us the opportunity to have him speak in today's session. Uh, Mr. Peter Bull is Vice Provost for Advances in Learning at the Charles and the Charles Carswell Professor of East Asian Languages and Civilizations. As Vice Provost, he is responsible for guiding support and services for faculty to create the best, highest quality 21st century learning and teaching environment on campus and as well as online. Through his office, he has budgetary oversight of Harvard X, the Harvard Initiative in Learning and Teaching, and Harvard X Research and Research Collaborations to advance the science of learning. He works across the university to develop policies and best practices for online and blended learning and foster closer collaboration with the Harvard Library, the museums, the Division of Continuing Education, and Harvard University Information Technology, as well as teaching and learning hubs such as the Bach Center. As the founding director of Harvard Center for Geographic Analysis, Peter has long been interested in how technology can be used to advance learning and teaching in all fields. He also teaches Harvard X courses, China X, one of the most ambitious and comprehensive massive open online courses ever produced, with content spanning over 15 months. He has taught on campus versions of the course in both traditional and blended formats for several decades. Peter's research is centered on, his, on the history of China's cultural elites and the national and local levels from the 7th to the 17th century. His books and articles have appeared in all East Asian languages. A global scholar, he leads collaborations between Harvard and leading institutions in China and Taiwan, directing the China Historical Geographic Information Systems Project with Fudan University in Shanghai, a, a GIS encompassing 2,000 years of Chinese history and the China Biographical Database Project with Academia Sinica in Taiwan and Peking University. Online relational database that includes 350,000 historical figures and is being expanded to include all biographical data in China's historical record over the last 2,000 years. Bol is the author of this Culture of Ours, Intellectual Transitions in Tang and Sung China, neo Shism in History, co-author of Sun Dynasty, uses of the Yi Ching, co-editor of Ways with Words, and author of various journal articles in Chinese, Japanese, and English. Mr. Bull, we have about 100 attendees today from across the world. On behalf of our team and the attendees, we thank you for taking the time to share with all of us your thoughts and insights around the future of technology and education. Without further ado, I'd like to pass the platform over to you. Over to you, okay. Mr. Bull. Yeah, thank you very much, Roger. Um, let's advance the slides and uh, start working. And thank you all for taking this time off to, uh, uh, to, to listen in. And I look forward 
be getting some of your comments. You've already will have gathered from, from Roger's very nice introduction that I am not a specialist in educational technology, but I use technology when I can. Uh, what I want to, to get at today are the ways in which actually within a research university in particular, um, and Harvard is a research university that encompasses a liberal arts and sciences college, uh, but is hardly representative of, uh, of, of higher education in general. But I want to get at sort of three major issues, which is how do we improve, improve uh, learning and teaching and learning in a residential research university? Then how do we create online learning opportunities that have value to the world and open our teaching to the world, but also have some value within uh, the university itself? And the third principal area is sort of data-driven research on teaching and learning and why I think we need to invest in that or why we do invest in it. From then, some sort of final issues having to do with audience and reuse. So next slide, please. So, you know, one of the things that strikes me about a, a university um, in general is, is that we really have different constituencies uh, that they're becoming they have different interests, uh, yet they're all increasingly dependent on technology. The faculty, um, on one hand, we've gained our positions largely uh, through specialization in a discipline, and our interests really are focused on the advancement of knowledge, and, and technology and even the university itself is, is seen as, as a vehicle, as, as, as a way of getting advancing to uh, doing that. Then we have the students who, you know, undergraduate level students in this case are, would be my main concern, but they're between, what, 17 and 22. They're going uh, f from family life to independent careers, uh, as, and as a dean once said, referring to their social networking, experimenting with new forms of int intimacy. Um, but they're very concerned about their career prospects, uh, and that doesn't always entail further formal education. And then we have the administration, which makes the investments in IT, investments in open online uh, learning, but has to balance its revenue and expenditure, bring in students and keep the faculty happy as they can and, and, and bring the donors along as well. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Clearly these, these interests can converge and overlap, but they are not the same. Um, yet we know that they're all dependent uh, on, on IT, the, uh, I think a, the university would fall apart today. Its administrative systems would fall apart if its IT system fell apart. Uh, faculty, for their part, are increasingly uh, using uh, much of their, uh, doing much of their research in a digital environment. And in fact, it seems to be fair to say that at this point, you can conduct pretty much all of your research uh, in the research cycle. Uh, within a digital context. Um, and then we have uh, the issue of technology and teaching. Our students, of course, are deeply embedded in social media. But I'm struck by the, to some degree, the lack of interest on teachers' part in using uh, IT and teaching, using the ed educational technology. Um, some cases, so encounter resistance, faculty who say, well, this doesn't really belong in the kind of education I want to be uh, promoting. But my sort of response to them generally is, do they think the web will become less important in, in their lives and in their students' lives and careers in the future? And if you think it's going to be less important, then, then ignore it. But if you think it's going to become more important, then you have a lot to deal with. Let's go on. Next slide. Um, one of my first concerns, I think, is, is that we try to begin from the right question. And before we ask what's the role of technology, and that is, I think, is really what do we mean by learning uh, for our students? Uh, you know, we as faculty have disciplines, but our students, even when they do majors, I don't think they conceive of themselves as part of a discipline. Clubs, maybe, sports teams, yes. Areas of interest, yes, but not as part of disciplines. Um, and yet we want our students to acquire knowledge and we want them to acquire 
good judgment. And so that's the point at which I ask, and at what points in this can technology make a difference? Next slide. Um, the students who are, we want to teach, who we want to learn, who we want to acquire competence and skills, uh, who we want to have critical thinking and critical reasoning, but they're here for four years. They encounter a wide variety of teaching over their 32 courses, and we can't really say that there's one form only that they should, uh, they should experience. Uh, let's be happy that they do lots of different things, from the large lecture course to smaller lectures, seminars, tutorials, service-oriented learning, field opportunities, and so on. Um, we've heard often enough that the lecture is dead. Um, it's not, and it won't be anytime soon, I suspect, for a very, very important reason, which is that it's the most cost-effective form of teaching. But some faculty are used to it, um, and students very often seem to like it, if only to have a moment of relaxation in their busy days. Uh, but what is the lecture for? That's where I think if we're talking about lectures, um, we need to begin. If it's a vehicle for information transfer, uh, then it's clearly not terribly effective. And it's not effective because we really have a hard time figuring out what the learning outcomes are from, um, from, from lecture courses. We see grade inflation and grade compression. These are both national trends after all. And we have, it's a, we have a hard time based on just grades of saying whether a course is effective in trans, transferring information and skills. Next slide. Um, so we can begin with the with question of uh, uh, poor attendance at courses. We did a study a couple of years ago, uh, became somewhat notorious, I'm afraid, that uh, looked at attendance at lecture courses uh, and found that non-attendance was high. And then one of the things we did along the way was look at the way in which students in courses that had very poor attendance made use of lecture videos. And what we discovered, counterintuitively at first, was that the worse the attendance, the worse the viewing of lecture videos. And we realized that this made sense after all. The students who are most committed to the course, who attend lectures, are most likely to review carefully, and they're going to remember that something was talked about in the lecture, they can see it from their notes, and they can go back and find it. Um, but if, a lecture is part of a sequence, then oh, even those students forget much of, if a lecture course is part of a sequence, forget much of what they learn in a, in a course after they take the final exam. If we have courses that are cumulative, that go on in sequence, then, then there's, at least they can build off of that. So there's sort of a, a cycle of absorbing a lot taking an exam, losing a lot, but then building back up. So it's cumulatively over time um, better. But uh, next, next, next slide, please. Uh, even though it's taking place uh, when students don't have cumulative courses, then of course they tend to forget. And so one question we always have to ask ourselves is, down the road, if students are gonna take only one course in Chinese history, what actually do I want them to remember from that? Um, so we know the how to do, we know we can address ineffective teaching and learning in, in, in lecture courses. Um, first question we should always ask is, are students not attending because they know it doesn't matter? Because either they know how to get the information to pass the exam, or because they know a lot of it already. In which case, I think we ought to be really offering students the opportunity for competency testing. If you think you know this course, if you think you know the material, take an exam, prove it, and then either get, get credit for it or advance the sequence. We can also, and we do, make use of clickers and polls. There's getting courses, large courses to review materials frequently. Uh, more and more, we have people interested in testing the knowledge that students have online prior to the lecture hour, where you can give them assignments. They presumably worked with a textbook. 
you give them a problem set online and, and the next morning the professor has a report that says, okay, these are the areas where students had problems where they made mistakes. The other thing we can do is uh, originally with the notion of flipped classrooms, but now I think more hybrid learning, is we can take the lecture and put it online and say, go watch the lecture and when we come to class tomorrow, we're going to talk about the reading, the, the historical problem or whatever it is. Um, but if you put the lecture online, you actually have to put assessments into that lecture because if you don't, uh, people will sleep through it, not pay attention, look at it at double speed, and you won't have gained much. But if you do that, then it's going to take students a lot more time to do. We think that sometimes it takes four or five hours to do what we thought was a simple lecture hour uh, because of the assessments and the fact that students will go back to avoid making mistakes. So in fact, what we found is that students don't like uh, flipped classrooms. They don't particularly like hybrid learning if they it means they have to do all the work the night before on a regular schedule. Um, and we can take this further uh, and say that, you know, when we actually take really active measures to try to advance student learning, for example, we did an experiment in, in, in a course in the sciences where half of the class was decomposed into small groups and they, a lot of the learning proceeded through peer-to-peer -peer discussion. The other half of the class listened to lectures. The people who listened to lectures thought they were gaining a lot. People who didn't listen, listen to lectures, who were in small group discussions, thought they were gaining much less than they would have from the lecture format, even though we could show that small group discussion was more effective in acquiring knowledge and in acquiring knowledge correctly and in retaining it for longer. Next slide. A, few, a couple of years ago, I was talking to a Harvard alum who had gone on to a career in journalism covering politics. And she said to me that when she had been a, a student, she had majored in, in, in politics, political science and government but that none of the courses she took in her department in her major had ever helped her. The courses that she had remembered that were most valuable to her were large lecture courses. Well, why? And then probing further was because those lecture courses were not about information transfer. They were about thinking. They were about how do I know something? How do I uh, think about a problem? What are the intellectual approaches that I can find here that I can apply to a broad range of issues? And, and that sort of leads me to a general point about learning, which is uh, we often say, uh, you know, we are what we know, but what we really mean, I think, is we are what we remember. And what we remember best is what we use. Sometimes this is factual knowledge and skills, which you have to keep up and maintain. That's cumulative course sequences matter. But sometimes it's ideas, and ideas are things we use as well and they can transcend their context. Um, now, when we get to courses that transfer information and teach skills, um, computer science is an obvious example, but statistics, foreign language, learning to mathematics, um, we know that students progress more quickly if they get frequent and steady, speedy uh, feedback on their mistakes and get ready uh, guidance right away. Now, we can do that kind of support in person to some extent, but it's very expensive. And so I think here that technology is becoming more and more essential. The fact that we can use automated code checkers means that students don't have to wait half a week to find out where their mistakes were, um, that we can use adaptive learning systems that respond immediately and that can track students along other paths, remind them of what it is, that, what their mistakes are, see where they're learning. Uh, what they have to learn next. These are these are very valuable things, and, and we're actually spending some time now trying to see is it worth to make a, a major investment in adaptive learning. And adaptive learning means, in fact, that we're moving some of the learning out of the class online. Uh, next slide. One of the uh, distinctions you often hear about is, well, this is a residential college, and you're talking about online learning. But 
that doesn't really hold water, I don't think. We, the extremes for me are face-to-face in-person teaching and something that's fully automated and a fully automated online course. And most of the time we're somewhere in between. After all, all courses um, at, at the moment have a presence in the learning management system that we employ across the university. Um, the idea should be to try to persuade instructors to make better use of that LMS. Uh, we, after all, know that instructors would like to know more about how their students are performing. And you can imagine that if we can start to tie in student performance with what we know about their other courses and start to develop some predictive models for which students will need what kind of support, um, we will help them and actually make our, our teaching more effective. Uh, we know students like to see how they're performing, particularly how they're performing relative to other students. Uh, we can use an LMS to build in adaptive learning elements uh, and uh, uh, smaller assignments into, into a course, into a course sequence. Uh, we can have uh, discussion forums, peer-to-peer -peer learning uh, elements for when students want to ask each other questions and check out problems. These can be built into the LMS. We have annotation projects that we can enable. Collaborative learning, collaborative projects are facilitated and so on. Um, next uh, slide. It's interesting, and now I'm just going to switch to the other end of the spectrum of automated online courses, uh, that Harvard does not offer its own students the option of taking fully online courses for credit. Um, we do actually have uh, online courses, but with uh, some of them are rather high touch, who are the uh, extension school, the Division of Continuing Education. Um, which our automated courses really are in the area of, uh, of MOOCs and open online courses, and I'll, I'll get to those in a bit. Um, now, this resistance to allowing students to take online courses for credit um, is for many a, a notion that they're, they're defending the value of residential education. But again, I think this is, makes the mistake of, of equating uh, all the advantage students acquire by being in residence with face-to-face -face instruction. After all, for m students being in res living at a college, um, they don't spend most of their waking hours doing courses and doing homework. Uh, they do four course semester-long courses a semester. It makes it easier for students to plan. It makes it easier for faculty to plan and to define faculty effort. effort. Um, but students are doing lots of different things. And I think it's only now that, at least at this university, we're beginning to question the idea that a semester-long course, 13 to 15 weeks, is the optimal way of learning anything. Um, or that preventing students from taking online equivalents of residential courses during the summer or while they're studying abroad is necessarily good for them offerings is defining what we think the learning outcomes should be. Um, I'm sure that allowing credit for online courses will happen, uh, but of course that means we have to create them. And this is where I think our, our experience building uh, MOOCs, massive open online courses, is going to serve as well. Um, we've been designing, building MOOCs now taught by regular faculty for over four years. We have around 100 courses online, uh, over 5 million registrations over that period, around a million, two million, a million and a half to two million users, people who really went into the course. Um, MOOCs are different from our traditional online offerings. Uh, first of all, and most important, they're built to be scalable. Uh, second, they are designed on the chunk and test principle, that is, we recognize that students watching videos or, in fact, listening to somebody talk about slides like I'm doing now, that their attention is going to slip at a certain point, uh, that uh, perhaps after four or five minutes, we really try to aim to break up the presentation of information or discussion and of information uh, and then put in assessments, tests, interactive things that keep students involved. Um, 
MOOCs can make great use of peer-to-peer -peer learning elements, and we've seen that in some MOOCs that um, questions that we thought you might have to have teaching assistance be answering can be answered almost all the time and very quickly and just as well by, by peers in the system. Next slide, please. Uh, we've been working hard to see how we can incorporate a variety of these interactive elements into MOOCs. Uh, we have now developed annotation utilities for text, for image, and for vi video. Uh, ability to do synchronous question and answer. Some cool mapping functions where students can do mapping on the web. Uh, building and adaptive learning elements, scientific diagramming. Uh, and a really interesting project that where you uh, use images that you're pulling in from different online sources, from let's say a museum in Boston and a museum in New York, something in San Francisco, and creating your own exhibition, creating your own annotation or discussion. And of course, online courses can be self-paced or timed, uh, even uh, if they're fully automated. But our goal has to be, and this has to do with being able to scale up, because our smallest course is in the thousands, but we've had, I think, almost 2 million registrants in our larger course, uh, the CS50, Computer Science 50, is to increase automation but not sacrifice things that help people remember what they and use what they know, and interactivity, engagement, and we need to maintain the rigor of the course. Um, it changes, I think, for faculty in very important ways. Uh, because for the first time, for many faculty, they now realize that designing and doing a course really requires that they get together and work with academic technologists and course designers. Um, and when they come in to design, to work with us on a, on a MOOC, we confront them really with the first question, which is, what is the outcome you want for students? How do you... How do you, what do you want students to learn? How do you want them to learn it? And then rather than just asking, can we take your lecture course and put it online, let's begin from the point of your course, the outcomes for students, and design from that to incorporate the information you want to have in the course. Um, this is a very new experience. This intentional and deliberate instructional design is a very new experience for faculty generally. Uh, and when we go through revisions, they begin to appreciate and see how them as an assignment for a class, for example, a residential class. We can use them in part of MOOCs or actually use them in multiple, multiple MOOCs. Um, but it is actually uh, hard to do. Uh, it's really to design a module so that it can stand on its own is hard to do. Uh, one thing we have seen is that learners uh, prefer, and I think faculty are coming to prefer, uh, short courses, uh, two weeks, four, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, that courses that are shorter can sustain in engagement, learner engagement much better. Thus, uh, we've gone about building the capability to create online courses and building up a course library. Uh, and over time, it seems to me that this is going to have some consequences for our curriculum that we're going to end up with by not in 2020, but by 2025, I think, with what will begin to look like a very different curriculum. Uh, next slide, please. Um, faculty, of course, have to spend a lot of time on a MOOC. They're not really getting compensated, given the amount of time they spend and not being co compensated. Uh, so shorter, shorter learning elements uh, that can be plugged into their face-to-face -face courses and used in MOOCs as well, I think is going to serve us well. And I think one of the things we'll be doing in, in the coming years is going to faculty directly and saying, do you have an hour of something you'd like to automate, you'd like to have online rather than doing it every year, or a problem set you'd like to have online and have corrected online and so on. Next slide, please. Uh, the third big thing I'm concerned with, right? So, resident. First thing was was sort of res, improving residential teaching and learning. Second is 
is uh, uh, is open is online learning and these MOOCs. The third is research. Um, we made a decision when we got involved with MIT to create edX that we would want to see if we could also use the large numbers of learners that would be involved and the fact that we'd have so much clickstream data to do research both by faculty but also by course designers on what makes for better teaching, more effective learning. So we've built up a research group. It's around eight or nine people at the moment. Uh, it's a centralized group. Uh, there's according to my office that has expertise in psychology, education, data science, design, computer science, and so on. We publish, I've, on the slide, I've given you the, uh, um, the URLs for their, their blogs and, and their publications. Uh, we also have a standard survey, which both Harvard and MIT have been administering in all their MOOCs since the start, which allows us to see how students have remained the same or have changed or how the audience has changed and remained the same. We'll come to that in a bit. Um, but generally, the, the point is to be that the analysis of learner behavior is vital to knowing how well a course is doing and what needs to be improved. Uh, next slide. So this is, of course, a question of, of click stream, uh, dealing with click stream data. It, it took us, I would say, almost a year and a half to two years to really have control over the clickstream data that was coming out of edX, um, and so that we could see what was going on in a course on a daily basis. Uh, we turning that clickstream data into meaningful variables has been uh, has been a challenge, but we accomplished it. Um, we were able to do A/B testing, randomized testing for improving assignments. So we're we have incremental ways and in small increments, uh, to be sure, of improving learner, learner engagement, analyzing discussion boards, and so on. But um, the other thing that we've learned is that given that we can do analyze MOOC clickstream data, we also have similar clickstream data coming off of the LMS. Uh, and so we've turned our research both to the online courses but also the on data. And that's one of the reasons why we know, of course, whether students actually look at lecture videos when they miss a class. Uh, we make a lot of this uh, available uh, within FERPA rules to uh, the research community. You can go to the uh, HarvardX research website and you can ask to get uh, access to uh, that data. Next slide. One of the largest problems I see in research, um, and it's not unique to education research. Uh, I've talked to uh, people in, in the medical school here and who say the same thing is, how do you get from research to practice? Um, there's, a, there's a lag time to be sure, um, but researchers are always, let's say, a step ahead in thinking about certain kinds of problems that the course teachers, the designers who, out of not necessarily out of sloth, but out of uh, being busy with presenting things in their own way, uh, don't keep up with. And so what we've tried to figure out is how do you motivate faculty to take research into account, educational research, and their role as educators. They don't need to be told this for their role as researchers, but for as teachers, they need to. And here, the Harvard Initiative in Learning and Teaching, you can see the URLs there has been enormously important to what we're doing. Uh, we have a very neat uh, biweekly newsletter, Into Practice, in which goes to all faculty and, 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 and teaching assistants, basically showing what the practice is of one particular fa faculty member for that week, uh, and then providing links to research as well. Convening meetings of faculty and staff, conferences on teaching and learning, uh, working with faculty innovation projects, all these have raised consciousness across the university. Uh, we also give grants, and grants are always a way to motivate people. Um, and even if you only give, as in our case, perhaps 10% of the applicants get grants, and perhaps even less than that, the fact that we've had 1,600 unique applicants for small grants means that you've had 1,600 people thinking about how they can improve their teaching and learning uh, and around half more than half usually are trying to think about it in terms of technology 
next slide. So, um, sort of trying to sum up this aspect of, of online learning uh, by talking about audiences. You know, we've as a we have a small, relatively compared to a state university, we have a small college. We have 7,500 undergraduates. Uh, until now, our faculty have reached the world outside with the exception of the few who gain public followings and become pop more popular writers. Basically, our faculty reach others through their research, through research publications. In other words, a very small slice of people just like them. Um, now, with MOOCs, we have the possibility of opening the doors, opening the gates, so to speak, and letting the world see our teaching. Um, but it's not just looking in on how we teach a campus class. It's really, with MOOCs, it's a matter of designing, redesigning those courses in an entirely new format. Um, we courses go from a th in the thousands to hundreds of thousands to nearly two million again. Um, and that audience is something that I'm particularly interested in because if you think about how you sustain something that's free, which is it's hard to do, you really want to know what kind of audience you have. And there are some things that surprised us. First of all, I think when MOOCs began, people thought they were going to disrupt higher education. That's not true as far as we can tell. As long as you don't give credit, academic credit and progress towards a degree, you're not going to disrupt higher education. Around 70% of our learners are post-BA, so they've graduated from college, and yet they're young, 70% millennials, and around 70, almost 70% international. It's my, my 370s rule that uh, post-BA, young, and international. They, uh, the kinds of courses they're responding to, however, really uh, have been very rather different at Harvard from generally what we see in the MOOC world. Um, if we look at the big MOOC providers, Coursera and edX, uh, they have increasingly, in their search for sustainability, focused on skills courses and their career advancement. Um, now, this is a little bit deceptive because edX, for example, is open source. The edX has, what, around 12 and a half million, 13 million learners. But in the last year, the number of institutions using open edX, the open source version, for their own institutions, and in some cases for whole countries, has gone from 400 to 800. So it looks to me like Open edX is on path to become a kind of a, stand, a standard, a, a platform standard for o offering open source online learning education, but also things that can be employed in, in an institution. Uh, now, at Harvard, we've been, when we look at our survey data. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, from our Harvard X courses, uh, Harvard MOOCs that we put on the Open edX platform, um, we've, uh, we've noticed uh, some interesting phenomena, right? The Open edX, the, the edX platform, um, or Harvard X course, online courses generally, are break down the divide between what's a college student and post-college. If you continue learning out of college, uh, then, then you're, uh, the line between, and particularly if more and more of what you do in college is going to be online, um, that, that line becomes blurred, I think. Uh, edX has worked with program, nano degree programs like MicroMasters to try to uh, broaden the pool. This is at the MA level uh, where MA programs, professional MA programs, really want to see their uh, their applicant pool being expanded, become more diverse, but also have a common standard. But for Harvard as a liberal arts university or as a liberal arts college, liberal arts and sciences, um, our courses are going to reflect faculty interests. We in fact are not well placed to produce courses that have direct bearing on job related skills that are good for career advancement. That sort of thing we tend to offer through our Division of Continuing Education. Um, and when we ask our survey, our, our, our learners, what motivated them, 80% tell us that it's lifelong learning, 80%. And when we ask, um, 
and how important is career advancement to you? There's a good deal of variation. It depends on the course, but in some overall, it's around 20%, 20 to 30% of the said career advancement is, is very important. Now, this is the reverse of what we generally see in the MOOC world. So if you were to go to, let's say, take all the learners on edX, subtract the Harvard learners, what you'd probably find is 80%, 90% career advancement and 10, 20% lifelong learning. Um, but given that our courses, our MOOCs are a third in the arts and humanities and another third in the social sciences, um, and then a third in, 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 well, a little bit less than a third in science and then some some skills and technical courses in addition, it makes sense that our learners are in fact lifelong learners. Uh, next slide. Um, so we have an audience of lifelong learners. Uh, they want to listen, they want to learn, but they don't necessarily want to offer financial support. But I'm not sure that that's where we sh should begin. And after all, as a university, we're justified ultimately by our commitment to learning. And if we focus on willingness to pay first, I think we run the risk of learning and of forsaking an audience that deeply wants to learn, whether it's biochemistry or cosmology, anthropology, philosophy, music, poetry, art history, history, whatever, politics, economics. Um, MOOCs only have a completion rate of around 2%. Uh, and we need to think about how we can increase that, but I'm not sure we need to give up the audience we have now. Uh, they are busy with their own careers, and this is we've tended to think of them as students as if they were in college. Say, so, well, you can do 10 hours a week of homework. Uh, if students in college would be willing to do that. Uh, but I think that if people are really post-BA and, and beginning careers, we need to have courses that are substantial and rigorous, but don't make the same time demands on, on a weekly basis. Better learning, adaptive learning, immersive technologies, more engaging interactive assessments, uh, mobile devices, peer-to-peer uh, -peer engagement, all of these involve technology. But um, they need to be part of a overall commitment to learning engineering, learning engineering in pursuit of better learning outcomes. Next slide. Um, we need to show, I think, if we're going to really develop lifelong learning in the liberal arts and sciences, we need to show the learners that we're going to take them seriously over the long term and that we will be with them over the long term. Um, there are all sorts of things we can do to, to get that message across from lifelong secure transcripts to uh, building communities of interest, trying to tie people together across national boundaries, bringing them into conversation. Um, we need to give something that people can see as an engagement that goes on throughout their life. And that's why I, I do think that whereas on campus we're concerned with 18 to 22 years old people, I'm concerned with people who are 22 to 82, a different cohort. Let's go on to the next. Um, and this is sort of, I'm getting now to this is my, my fi just final slides, but this is, is the one-off problem. You know, if we invest tens of thousands of dollars in building MOOCs uh, and, and developing staff and designers to create learning, uh, these learning opportunities at, at multiple levels, multiple lengths. Um, the danger is that everything becomes a book in its own right, right? A unique thing that you put on the library shelf and after the first year or two, nobody reads. Uh, we have, we build up enormous quantities of video, think of all the guest lectures that come to ca campus, the videos of, of lectures in class for the, the students in the class. And the question for us is, how can we reuse these? Because if we can't reuse them, this is an awfully expensive proposition, awfully expensive proposition if it doesn't pay for itself. Uh, next slide. And so our solution, our approach to uh, dealing, solving this problem uh, has been to do two things. One is to really see if we can gear the uh, online learning platform uh, more towards 
creating thematic clusters with many kinds of digital assets, not just courses that have tests and give grades and give certificates. Um, this would allow us to incorporate all these occasional talks that happen on campus to make them part of it. Um, the second approach, and this is, uh, I think, has tremendous promises, is a software as a service product. We're calling it DART, Digital Assets for Reuse and Teaching, and I've given you a URL for that. But the goal is to make digital assets findable. The idea is put your, put your materials on a platform, make it possible to search them and, and preview them very, very quickly, and then uh, let the person decide do they want to go on to a course, to register for a course, to get a certificate, do assessments, participate in discussion forums, or do they just want to see those elements that they've discovered that fit their interest? Next slide. We've done something more with this. We've done something for, uh, for teachers. We discovered that in our, uh, we should be on the next slide, I think it's coming up. Yeah, um, we discovered that 30 to 40%, depending on the course of our learners and HarvardX courses are teachers. So we have a special commitment to them, it seems to me, as people who are also committed to learning and helping students learn. And so what we've developed is the ability to preview sections of HarvardX courses and eventually other digital assets at the university to cut them out and drag and drop them into your own website, into your own LMS. And our hope is that once we've thoroughly tested this during the coming academic year, we'll be able to offer this to the world, not only making the Harvard material accessible, which it will always be open in any case uh, through YouTube or through edX, the edX platform, but also to set it up so that a, any other university could take its digital assets and run them through a transcription system uh, and then make them available to their uh, to their own community or hopefully to the entire world. So the world, if I think about where we want to go, it's that we should be able to share across institutions. But sharing education is not easy, it's a challenge. Um, technical standards change and systems change, and that's also a challenge. We develop at different rates. We're capable of different levels of investment. They're never equal. Um, but still, um, the road I think we're on is a road towards greater sharing, greater awareness, greater interactivity. And I think in the end, that's good for all of us. So I'm sorry I've gone on too long. Um, and that's the point at which I want to stop. And Perhaps there's some questions and challenges that you want to bring up with me. And I hope you'll take a look at some of the URLs you've seen uh, on, uh, on this presentation. So thanks a lot and uh, look forward to some questions. Hello, Peter. This is Annie here. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your valuable input. Um, before we take questions from the audience, I just want to first say thank you so much for sharing that insight. It was very insightful and informative. Uh, one of the questions that we have from the audience is, what does active learning mean to you, and how does that affect the future of, uh, the future of education? So by active learning means to me that students are, to the greatest extent possible, engaged in uh, the educational process, and engaged in traditionally that could just be reading a book. But I think with active learning, we mean something more than that, is having read the book being able to discuss it and debate it with others, to be able to undertake activities uh, in a course that um, might be allow them to build off the knowledge they gained from a book or from a lecture. Um, the simplest way of saying it, I guess, is to say that active learning is engagement. And to the degree we want students to be engaged because we think that Using what you remember, what you know, is the way to really make use of it in the long term and, and maintain it. Um, I think that means that courses will increasingly have to engage students, allow us to figure out ways in which students can become engaged uh, actively in the course. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, one of the other questions that we have from the audience is, 
what is the experience applying to uh, what is the experience applying technology driven teaching pedagogies in social science discipline such as economics in developing countries could you talk a little bit on that so speaking specifically to a course the course content in economics let's say of developing countries and things like this I, I can't answer that uh, we, I know we're working on on MOOCs that uh, are going to be addressing that but let's speak more generally about what is the technology that we see as part of education in the social sciences and here I think we might want to speak about sort of a, 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 a toolkit of things students should be exposed to during their four years in college. Uh, one, the one that I know best is, is, is GIS, but uh, the one we see students really, really uh, wanting now is data science and ways of dealing with large amounts of data, so quantitative skills. Um, to some extent, these are statistical, but not only. Uh, I think learning to use R, for example, to handle large amounts of data is becoming uh, more and more expected and in certain areas, learning uh, to use the software for social network analysis, but also understanding the background of social network analysis, um, or the mathematics of social network analysis is important, particularly dealing with large amounts of data. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I'm just going to take one more question for the day. We're just going to hit our time slot, uh, but just to go ahead with this, uh, somebody's asked from the audience is how do you tie in implementation funding to innovations that you propose in these learning advances or classroom? Uh, could you repeat that question again? How do you tie innovation how, funding? Implementation funding to the innovation. To the innovations. Yes. Okay, so one of the things we decided to do, uh, we, we've we've experimented with different kinds of grant programs. And we realized that actually the small grant, um, five to fifteen thousand dollars, for example, that uh, is gets the most interest. It doesn't. It's not too large for somebody to say, "Oh, that grant's going to be a burden." It means they can hire some students or a graduate student, uh, or get some uh, some developer time. And what we do with those is say that what we find is say, okay, so what's what is it that you want to innovate? What is it that you want to do? Or what is it that you want to test? What is the piece of research you want to, problem you want to address with this? And it's not simply enough to give them money and to sort of review their proposal. We also have found that it makes a lot of sense to give them coaches, to have people who've had experience doing implementation grants and, and innovation grants, to sit down with them and say, okay, think about this, think about that. So here, professional staff, academic professional staff, that um, academic technologists are a godsend. They're the ones actually who have, usually have far more experience than faculty and students in doing these sorts of things. And we rely on them increasingly, not only to help us review applications, but also to help us help, help those who receive grants to realize them and bring them to fruition. Phil, and uh, I think, you know, we're just going to quickly uh, wrap mm -hmm. one more question before we go. Okay. And then um, I think, you know, I don't want to disappoint that person who asked the question. But I think right. the last question that we want to know is technology in classroom is great, but how do you engage technology solutions that expand beyond classroom? Uh, also, in a nutshell, could you give your comments on uh, where does future of IT, you know, where is the future of IT or where does education head? Uh, forward from 2025, uh, what is the specific that Harvard is doing to drive that uh, innovation um, in in any yeah. in any sphere of what it's doing currently? So that's of course a big and broad question, uh, but if we're talking thinking about where where we're going in the future, I think that we should expect that uh, that more courses will have significant online elements. And they'll have online elements in part for the effectiveness of teaching and learning, but also because by having data like that and combining that data with what we know about students, their careers, how they, their SIT scores, for example, the other courses they've done, 
we'll be able to have a better understanding of the students and be able to give them more help. I think that is uh, the development of, of models, of predictive models of student behavior and student problems. Um, we know, for example, already that, and I think everyone will know this intuitively, that the students who do best in science are the students who begin with the strongest background in mathematics. Um, well, um, are there things, uh, at what point or what areas can we see that students can get a stronger background or need help? These are things that I think we have to, we have to pursue. Um, I think that at a certain moment uh, that, you know, students, high school students come to college with their own culture. And uh, there are more of them than there are of us as faculty. And we, we can tinker around the edges, but in many ways, culturally, they drive, they drive things. And as students coming out of high school bring with them the expectation that a significant amount of learning and knowledge gathering happens online, I think we're going to have to be prepared to do that. And uh, that's probably not a bad thing because we'll be able to learn a lot by watching students learn online. Okay. Thank you, Peter, for addressing that. That was yeah. very, very informative. Uh, we've reached towards the end of our session, and I'd quickly like to take some ending notes um, uh, by first thanking you and the audience for joining us today. We've got really, really, you know, uh, happy to bring forward such forum wherein we can get different speakers and thought leaders across the world to come and just share experiences of what they're doing, uh, especially to those institutions who really don't have very advanced teams or uh, have smaller budgets to do, you know, minimalistic in terms of learning or management or IT, wherever that nomenclature may be, right? But, um, right. you know, we're going to share, share the link for today's recording, and it'll be posted on our campus consortium website and social media sites, right? Uh, and uh, we'll definitely send out a feedback survey just to know about the session being informative and insightful. Of course, it's been, but we always get feedback coming from our audiences, so please look out for a survey from us. Last but not the least, uh, we've got the Campus Consortium Grant Program. Uh, we do help institutions with a smaller IT budget try to implement uh, or help them implement some strategic objectives, right, starting from the Web and Mobile Campus Grant, uh, Studio for Students Grant, Attendance Grant, Cloud Hosting Grant, Single Sign-On, Mobile Campus, Campus Safety. So we've just covered a whole purview, including artificial intelligence. It will be really, really nice for institutions who have joined us today to uh, go to our website and see these grant programs and see if any of them can benefit you. <clears throat> Last but not least, this is, um, <clears throat> we have these grant programs running from time to time and uh, they've got different dates coming in. Uh, there are rolling grants for every month. There's a new deadline, there's a new date. You, you know, if you want to subscribe to us, please send us an email. You can su subscribe to us. And that's it for today. Thank you everyone once again. This is Annie Hughes signing off from uh, the Campus Consortium Ed Talks. Thank you, Peter. Have a great day. Thank you all. Bye. You too. Bye-bye.